Welcome to the Project Endure podcast, the place where we talk about life, endurance, persistence, perspective, and so much more. I'm Joe Rinaldi, and I'll be your host. Let's jump in. Before we get started, let me ask you a question. Have you ever noticed that what you wear has the power to change how you feel? Project Endure Apparel is designed to remind you that easy won't make you stronger and that growth is an uncomfortable choice that we all have the privilege to make every day. Look good, feel good, and perform good. Head to the link in the show notes to shop Project Endure Apparel and keep on doing hard things. Now, let's get to the episode. Welcome back to the Project Endure podcast, episode 139. We have myself, Joe Rinaldi, and we have a very, very, very special guest down in North Carolina, Caleb McCoy II. Caleb, how are you, man? I'm pretty good, Joe. Um, Just want to say thank you for the opportunity, uh, being able to come on here and, and, you know, share share some of my story and hopefully uh, inspire and help somebody. Of course, man. It's a it's a pleasure and a privilege to have you on the podcast. And from the little bit that I know of your story, I know that uh, it's very deep, very impactful, and I'm so excited to hear more of it. Before we get into any of that, though, how would you introduce yourself to an audience member who maybe has never heard your name before? <laughs> um. So I would I would say that I'm. Caleb McCoy II, and I am a proud member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians here in Cherokee, North Carolina. I'm a pr- I'm, uh, a person in recovery, and what that means for me is I've not used uh, meth or opioids in almost uh, about over six years clean, and so um I tried to to practice the principles of recovery with service work, with taking inventory, with um, having uh, for me having a relationship with God. And um, I'm a, I'm a running coach. I am a co-founder of a nonprofit organization where we focus on mental health issues and addiction recovery. We're going to be opening up a men's transitional home. My wife and I, when I say we. And I'm a husband and a father of two sons, and uh, I'm a recovering father as well. I've got a lot of a lot of work to do uh, with my sons because I was absent out of their life for so long. So, yeah, and I love to run marathons. So that's a little bit about me. I love how much of an open book you are, and it's going to make this conversation very interesting for myself and for everybody listening. And so before we dig into your story, the first question that I ask every guest on the podcast is what's the hardest thing or circumstance that you've ever had to handle in life that you did not get to choose for yourself? And I don't know how you're going to answer that question, but I would love if you could to tie that into just your overall story, because I think your life story has a lot to offer. The hardest thing that I've had to overcome. Mm Mm-hmm. I would say the childhood trauma that I experienced growing up, um, a lot of domestic violence in my house, a lot of uncertainty, um, toxic being my mom and dad had a very toxic relationship and marriage and not having the emotional intelligence to, or, or having somebody to really walk through me walk, walk with that challenging time of my life. Um, walk with me during that challenging time of my life was really, really difficult, Joe. And, um, it laid me down a deep, dark road of trying to cope with substances, with, with drugs, with, um, you know, using those things to, to escape my reality instead of facing that pain and that trauma head on and, raising my hand and asking for help. You know, I never knew how to do that. And that's one of the hardest things that, that, uh, I've ever had to overcome and endure. Um, and 
you know, I, it got to the point to where um, because I had so much of that childhood trauma and stuff and and I don't know. So I don't want to just sit here and, and make it sound like my mom and dad were not loving because they were. Um, they were doing the best that they knew how with what they've been given. And but still yet, you know, um, it was challenging for for me. And um, I got off on the wrong path early on in, in high school. And I was an athlete and I played football, basketball, ran track, got mixed up in the partying scene. And uh, using drugs was my escape. And it helped me to, I guess, be comfortable, comfortable in my own skin. And um, I had, so I barely graduated high school. And I had my sons at 18 and 19 years old. And uh, I was using um, a lot of drugs at the time. And I was absent from their life from a very early age. And, uh, you know, that's the thing about addiction, man. It takes you further than you want to go, you know. And, and it it seems like it's given you this false sense of reality and, and comfort and everything, but yet it's taken everything that is valuable, um, from your life. And so relationships, um, goals, ambition, uh, healing, um, purpose, all those things, you know, and, um, my son, and I've got all these fingerprints all over my story, Joe, where I feel like God was just intervening in my life, and I didn't have the eyes to see it at the time. And uh, I remember my youngest son was five years old at the time, and I was I, had, I didn't have a job at the time, and I was uh, living with a girl I, I was in a relationship with, and there again, I was repeating what I had seen and just being in a toxic relationship. And my dad got sick around that time, and this was 2013. and. Uh, I was snorting pills and using using meth from time to time and cocaine. And um, I remember getting that news of my dad having stage four pancreatic cancer. And he was they gave him six months to live. And I was devastated because I'm named after my dad. This is my best friend. This is the the person I was closest to in my life. and. Uh, I didn't know how to deal with it, man. And like I said, the only way I knew how to cope was with drugs. And so I graduated from snorting pills to um, doing something that I said I was never going to do, which was shooting gut. Because I always, <clears throat> I like to, during my addiction, I would always put these guardrails up and I would tell myself, well, as long as I don't do that, as long as I'm not like those people, then I'm I'm fine. And that thing for me was as long as I never shoot up, then I got this under control. Like I'm, I got me, I'm taking care of me. And when I get that news, my dad was going to pass away from cancer. Um, I remember the girl that I was with had brought home some syringes and I'm locked in the bathroom, Joe, for a really long time. Just I'll pull up this pill in the syringe. I've got it in my hand and I'm looking at it and my son, my five-year-old son comes to the door. <clears throat> he knocks on the door and he's like, dad, what are you doing? And I just stopped and I was, you know, it was so profound. And it was like, I knew I needed to walk out in that moment, you know? And, but I was thinking like, well, this is, this is going to help me. You know, this is the thing that I need to do right now to help me deal with the news that I just received. And so I remember putting a towel at the bottom of the door and, uh, shooting up for the first time and two things happened. One was the euphoria that I felt and the numbness and the ability to just escape the reality that I was facing. And two was the, an, an immense amount, amount of shame just came over me. And I was like, Holy crap, you know, I, here I am. I'm doing the thing that I said I was never going to do. And it was kind of like one of those one of those things where it's like, well, I'm here now. You just might as well keep rolling with it. And so that's the mindset that I had. And uh, my dad passed away um, in 2014. But before he did, I moved into the house with him. Actually, the same house that I'm sitting in right now. He left this house to me. And uh, I moved into the house with him thinking I was going to take care of him. And um, I started to 
develop such a crippling habit, such a, such a really strong drug habit that it got to the point to where I would come down these steps that you can see in the background right here. I could hear my dad in, in his bedroom and he'd go to the bathroom. Um, and I knew he had his pills in his pillowcase and he'd try to hide them from me. And I would sneak into his door. He was in the bathroom, just sick from the chemo, puking, diarrhea. And I'm crawling across the floor, Joe, just being as quiet as I could be. And I'd sneak into his pillowcase and I'd steal a bunch of his pain medication to fuel my own habit because I was withdrawing so bad. Um, and he ended up getting it, he ended up getting a safe, putting it in his room. I found out the the combination. I got into his safe, continued to steal his pain medication, um, writing out checks, taking money out of his savings account. And, you know, he would he would ask me from time to time, like, where did I go wrong with you? And again, you know, I, I would party with my dad. I was I was, you know, using using drugs with my dad, but I can't blame my dad. I was a grown man doing these things. And uh, I knew right from wrong. And um, so I'll just tell him, you know, dad, this is this is this is on me. This is not you. I'm a grown man. I make my own decisions. And he got to, he got really, really sick in September of 2014. I remember I was digging ginseng in the woods and that was how I would fuel my drug habit. I would dig ginseng, go sell my ginseng, go get my fix. So I'm, in, I'm digging ginseng this one day and my mom calls me and she says, you need to get to the hospital right now. Your dad's about to pass. And so I remember running out of that, out of the woods. And I, I even thought to myself, I was like, after I finished that, I even, I got in the truck, started driving to the hospital. I was like, man, I could, I can still run. Like, like it's been, it'd been years, like 10 years since I had ran. And I was like, man, I could, yeah. Anyhow, I get to the hospital and my dad's in the hospice room and uh, I, I remember going to sleep by his bed. This is a few nights before he had passed and uh, I woke up the next morning and he hadn't moved in a few days. But when I woke up the next morning and I was like, where's my dad at? I was asking the nurses and they're like, we moved him down the hall. Did you feel him wake up last night? And this is just the bond that we had a good example of it. But he hadn't been able to talk or move in a couple of days. And I was like, um, no, I didn't know he'd woke up last night. I was telling a nurse and she was like, yeah, your dad rolled over um, and put his arm around you. And I was sleeping right by his bed in the recliner. And he mustered up the energy um, and the strength to, to hug me, you know, and I go over to his new hospice room and the day he passed, I was in the bathroom that's connected to the hospice room. And I could hear my dad's heart rate monitor beeping. It's beeping and it flat lines. And, uh, I had a syringe in my arm and I remember pulling that syringe out of my arm and wiping my arm off, you know, cleaning up the blood. And I walk out of the bathroom and I go over to my dad's bed and he's gone. And I remember kissing him on the forehead and uh, this is his necklace. And he had that necklace on. He had this necklace on. And I was thinking to myself, man, I said, I wonder who's going to get his necklace. But I knew, Joe, that if I got the necklace, I would have sold it. And I, I went and spent it on drugs. And I remember my aunt walks over to him and takes the necklace off his neck, my his sister, and puts it on her neck. And um, I left the room. And I called my my drug dealer and I said, Hey, I need you to meet me in town. I need some, I need some pills. My dad just died right back to it. Um, only except this time I didn't want to live this time. I, I got to the point to where I could not stand myself. I could not stand to look at the person looking back at me in the mirror. And, uh, I just thought that, I wasn't worth the breath that God had given me. And so I dive deeper and deeper into my addiction and it gets to the point to where I'm trying to commit suicide by overdose. 
particularly particularly in 2016, this really, really crazy event, this thing happens where it's November 2016, actually. So seven years ago, um, I remember being in the bathroom here at the house. And I go into the bathroom, lock myself in the bathroom, and I had a bunch of heroin and meth. And I loaded it up in the syringe, and I stare at the syringe again. And I think to myself, this is going to kill me. This is enough to kill me. And I was like, you know what? I deserve, I really deserve to die. Like I'm better off not being here. I go, I'm just a burden on my family because I've, I've just got so much, you know, I let them down. I've disappointed them. And uh, again, you know, that, that heaviness, the, the weight of shame is just crushing me. And so I shoot up, walk out of the bathroom within two, three minutes, I fall on the floor, overdose. We had a big party going on here. Everybody leaves except two people. The girl that I was with and a, and a guy that, I, that I'd grown up with and known my whole life. They dragged me into the bathroom, uh, put me in the bathtub. Didn't know CPR, but they're beating on me, beating on my chest, trying to get me to, trying to revive me and work on me. Um, Called the ambulance and uh, they start throwing cold water and, I, and ice on me. And so, Every now and again, I'd come back. I'd take a breath, and I'd go back out. I was unresponsive by the time the EMT got here. I was I had uh, my lips were blue, my eyelids were blue, ears blue, and I hadn't been breathing in a few minutes. And so they narcan me twice, and um, still unresponsive. And the EMT worker calls the ER doctor, and she says he's gone. And the ER doctor says, if you have more Narcan, you continue to work on it until you have nothing left. So she did that. And uh, finally, I've come to. And uh, it, honestly, it's, it's, it's crazy because it's right here on this wall. I woke up and uh, I ran everybody off. I was like, I want to get the hell out of my house. I want you guys here. I'm good. I, I can take care of me. So. 2017 comes around a few months later I have outstanding warrants on me and they finally catch me and they put me they locked me up and my bond was oh my god $180,000 so I knew I wasn't getting out I was going to be cooling my heels for a while so a couple weeks two three weeks in my jail stay Joe something profound happens uh, I didn't grow up going to church. I never knew who God was. Uh, I never had really heard about Jesus. And <clears throat> like I said, two or three weeks into this jail stay, something just is on my heart, man. And, and for the first time in my life, I decided I needed to pray. And I needed to cry out to God. And that's why I think sometimes suffering is suffering is sacred. You know, and, and pain is a great teacher and can lead us to the promised land. And looking back on that now, you know, just seeing what God was orchestrating is just beyond anything that I could have ever planned out myself. And so I'm writing this prayer down for the first time in my life. And I've still got the paper in my hutch here. And I'd been journaling some while I was in jail. And before this event happens, you can see the person who I was and the transformation that happened. But it was before this event, it was GD this, F this, can't wait to get out of here. Going to go, you know, back to the street, start selling, blah, blah, blah this and that, you know, and uh, just talking a whole lot of mess about nothing. And I start writing this prayer out and I'm like, God, I really need you. Um, if you're real, show me something. Show me that my dad's still with me. And this is on a Friday, this pastor, this minister um, had been coming to the jail on, on Wednesday for years. And so he broke his tradition. He was sitting at a hospital visiting a man. And God told him, you need to get to the jail and share the gospel with somebody. So he comes to the, comes to the jail, comes to the pod that I'm in. Didn't go to any other pod, comes to the pod that I'm in. And he walks in and I'm coming back down the stat coming back down the steps, I wrote this prayer out and I go upstairs, come back down and I see this man. And I just called out 
crying out to God for him to show me that my dad was still with me. And I lay eyes on this man, and he is there's such a striking resemblance of my dad. And he's got the same flannel shirt, same type of flannel shirt my dad wore, same pants, belts the same. He tucked his shirt in. His mustache is trimmed the same way. He's got blue eyes like my dad. Excuse me, green eyes like my dad. His must, like I said, his mustache is trimmed the same way. He wears his watch to the, on the inside of his wrist, just down to the detail. Like, oh my god. Um, he comes in and he's like, you know, shares the gospel with me, and this message of like, all for me, it was like hearing about all this pain and all this stuff that I've been going through, and this and, and and how I was carrying it, and it was just destroying me. It was like you don't have to carry that. Like God will take that. And God will use that pain that you've been through and turn it into purpose and to help somebody else. And that's what I needed to hear, Joe. You know, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And it was like a light switch moment, man. And I just, it was a radical transformation. And I, I'm i still friends with some of the guys that I, I was doing time with at the time. And we were all crying. Like grown men in jail, you don't see crying. We were all crying because I told them what had just happened and they seen just the profound impact that it had on me. And as he's leaving, he shakes my hand the same way my dad used to. And he places his left hand over ours. He winks at me. He says, I love you, son. Same way my dad used to. And it was just, I, the, you know, the cherry on top. And he walks out and I just start writing and I called my mom and, uh, my mom said she knew in that moment everything had changed. She's like, I knew when you called me that you were different. From that morning until that evening, you were a different person. And so while that transformation was instant, I knew that I had to put in the work. And I knew that the real work starts whenever that door popped and I walked out, you know, um, because I was isolated, I was protected in the jail. There was no drugs. There was no temptation. There was, it was a time for, to allow God to strengthen me, my spirit, my emotion, my, my physical well-being. because I started to do jailhouse workouts. We started to build camaraderie within our jail pod with the guys I was doing time with. And, you know, it was burpees, it was air squats, it was push-ups, it was, uh deck of cards you know we we're doing rows on on the bucks like we's getting it in and and that's how i fell back in love with fitness and that's how i fell back in love with moving my body you know and and just draw drawing close to god and during that time i had i seen a newspaper article come across the table and um my tribe here in cherokee partners with the tribe in oklahoma um cherokee nation and we, re we retraced the northern route with the Trail of Tears. When the government took our land, forced us out west. So we start in New Echota, Georgia on bikes and go out to Oklahoma. Or our two tribes come together and do that. And so I see this article about this bike ride. And I'm like, oh, my God, when I get out of here, I'm applying for that bike ride. You know, I want to try to, you know, just be a light for other people who are, who are in recovery, like or, who are still suffering from addiction. And I just want to try to help people, inspire people. So I get out of jail and um, I go to apply for this bike ride and they tell me I couldn't do it because I, I had a failed drug conviction. So try to get the rule changed, everything, and um, they weren't going to allow it. In the meantime, I had went eight weeks post-release and I signed up for an Ironman 70.3 with no training, just out of jail in early recovery Bought a mountain bike and I rode the mountain bike for like four or five weeks. <laughs> and so um, I literally ran a quarter mile and I had shin splints so bad before the race. I was like, I don't know how I want to do this. But every time I go into something, I always remember what God's brought me through and the things that I've overcome. And I'm like, this ain't nothing compared to that. And so try to keep things in perspective. So I complete that, that half Ironman and I was hooked. You know, I loved the community. I loved the challenge of it. Um, you know, and, and so I'm trying to get this rule change for this bike ride. I'm standing in front of my council members and the chief and vice chief, and it's being aired on TV. 
And honestly, I think it was just a little ego in the moment, but I was like, look, if you guys don't let me ride the bike, I'll freaking run to Oklahoma. And everybody kind of scoffed. I remember looking around, we call it the horseshoe where everybody sits in the council house. And I remember seeing some people scoff. And I was like thinking to myself, man, they don't believe me. Like they, they just, they remember Caleb, the addict, the junkie. They don't believe this person standing in front of them. I'm like, you know, but I, I said, I'm going to put in the work and I'm going to trust God that God's going to do something powerful with this. And so that was November of 2008, 2017, that I stood up in front of my council members and said this. May of 2018, May 14th, I started my run to Oklahoma. And I ran 800 miles in 40 days um, along the Trail of Tears. And uh, for a guy in early recovery, and I was 40 pounds, 30, 40 pounds heavier than I am now. Like I was like taking that step, you know, and, and having just that little seed of faith. Like, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but I know what God's brought me through. And I know that if I just show up, put one foot in front of the other and share my story and, and talk about what I've been through, it's going to help somebody. And so June 28th, my birthday, uh, finished in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. And, um, you know, that's, that's how I fell in love with fitness. That's how I fell in love with doing hard things. Dude, I know that this is only a fraction of the whole story, but, uh, I don't know if you could tell over here, but I have some tears in my eyes and, um, it's just amazing as a man of faith to hear your story and to hear the lead up to that moment when you found God and just the way it happened. And I mean, I guess the first question out of many that is on my mind is, do you feel like everything needed to happen the way that it did for you to become the man that you are today? Honestly. I hate to say this, but yes, I wish that I could say, you know, oh, uh, maybe if I go spend time with some guru or maybe if I read a book or maybe if, you know, I just hang around the right people that something will rub off, you know, something will, will, would, would have helped me go on a different trajectory. Um, man, I just had to go through it. I just had to go through it, man. And, uh, I think that that's how it has to be, unfortunately, sometimes. And yes, there are some things I'd go back and, and, and change. Obviously, I'd go back and change some of the hurt that I caused people, some of the disappointment. I'd go back and, you know, those, those things that I did to my dad. I wish I could change that. Heck yeah, in a heartbeat. Um, but all in all, man, I, I've, I'm thankful for the journey that I've been on and just being able it wouldn't mean as much to me if I wasn't able to give back and in, in such a way that's, that helps other people, mm. you know? And I think that's the most important thing. Like if I just kept to myself, like nobody had, knows you have a testimony unless you testify. And so if I just kept all that, the trauma, the victories, the defeats, the tri the triumphs, all that, you know, to myself, it wouldn't mean anything. And so one last detail that is just mind boggling to me is that EMT worker 2016 that saved my life. Um, my wife and I, Caitlin, we started talking in substance abuse treatment classes. She was outspoken. I was outspoken. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I like this redhead. She's pretty cute, you know? And uh, we, we, we became friends and that's what it was for, for several months actually. And, just hang, hanging out, supporting one another. And uh, I remember going to pick her up from our first date and I'm sitting in her, she's living with her mom, Caitlin. She's got a powerful story as well, but she was on house arrest for a long time. She went to prison. So she was living with her mom and um, I'm sitting there talking to her mom and just telling her a little bit of my story and start telling her about this overdose that takes place. <clears throat> and her mom starts crying and her mom says, you know who saved your life? I said, no. She said, that was me. So before I even married my wife, three years prior, her mom is the person that saved my life. Um, that's God, bro. That's God. 
what was your reaction in that moment? <laughs> uh, I mean, my, my jaw hit the floor. My jaw. And I remember me and Caitlin talking about that after we lay. Like, can you believe that? Like, that is so crazy. Um, and just knowing in that, like, knowing that God had brought us together for a purpose mm. and uh, just trusting that, man, you know, and that's been something we fall, we've, we've always fell back on whenever we have those tough times. It's like, man, we, we know we're supposed to be here. Let's just, let's just keep pushing. That is so beautiful. And getting to meet both of you guys last month was really powerful. And um, I'm excited to hear more of Caitlin's story as well. Uh, for now, I have a couple other questions about uh, parts of your story. I think this first question is very applicable to anybody going through anything, because I think we all, whether or not we have uh, something that is defined as an addiction, we all have tendencies. We all have those things that maybe we know we shouldn't be doing, or we would rather not be doing. And you, you use this term guardrails and you said, well, as long as I don't do that, as long as I don't shoot up, I'll be okay. And I'll keep this clean and contained in this defined box. And it's clear now in hindsight that you couldn't and you didn't. And I'm wondering if there's, for somebody listening who is in that situation where they think, I've got this thing, I've got this habit, I don't love it, it's not great, but I'll just keep it contained. Um, what would you tell that person who thinks that they can do that? Man, I think that just understanding that it's a slippery slope and it's like, I think it's all tied back to dopamine. I mean, not to get too scientific, but you know, it's what Kayla and I used to talk about this all the time. It wasn't even the high that, that it wasn't even shooting up. that got us high. It was calling the dope man and saying, Hey, we're on our way and fixing the drugs. And so that right there, um, we, we fell in love with that. You know, that's what, that's the thing that helped us to feel that euphoria. And so whenever you're talking about like other things, it doesn't have to be substances. What if it's porn? What if it's food? What if it, you know, those things there's, you're always going to go a step further because when that doesn't do the trick anymore, you're going to go a step further. And so I think that taking inventory of that, telling on it, like I said, that's, that's one of the toughest things to do is to raise your hand and say, I don't have this under control. Like I need help. I don't want this to be con the the thing that is the compass in my life, I guess you could say. Mm. That's a great answer. And I agree that raising our hands and asking for help is one of the hardest, if not the hardest thing that most of us could do. Um, and on that note, right? So you didn't ask for help. You went down this path. You used the word shame and the weight of shame was a phrase you had used. And shame is a really powerful word. So first, I'm wondering what shame means to you. And then two, how have you been able to, or how are you overcoming that shame from your past? I think that shame can mean a few different things. I think that there is a amount of shame that leads us to repentance, right? That helps us to turn a different direction. And that, I think that is, that's good, right? I think that that is healthy. Um, the shame that I'm talking about specifically is when your whole identity and being is completely tied up into the thing that you're struggling with and it's keeping you prisoner and it, it allows, it, it is controlling how you love yourself it is controlling how you take care of yourself um, and it becomes a prison. If you stay stuck there, that's not good. If it's, a, if it's an amount of shame that applies pressure that causes you to change, then that's, that's a good thing. But if, it, if it's an uh, overwhelming weight like I was in, that wasn't good. You know, that wasn't of God. That wasn't. Yeah, that's not beneficial. And so how have you been able to, or are you still in the process of unweighting that shame of letting go of some of that from the past? 
I think giving back. If we're not serving, we're not recovering. And so it's it's really important that you find places where you can give back to people who are less fortunate, who, who um, like right now I'm going through it with my son, my 17 year old son, and I see a lot of tendencies in him that I was that I had at his age, and it's scary. And um, you know we're we're just grinding through this really tough time in our lives right now, family therapy and doing all those types of things. Um, so I, I really think that, yeah, just, just giving back is really, really important. For sure. So you mentioned asking for help is one of the hardest things that you've ever done. Um, was there a moment that you realized you needed help? Was that in jail? Was that after jail? Was it before jail? That was in jail. That because but up up until that point, it was ego. It was I got this. It was this this false bravado, like that I was okay and I was strong and I had it all together. And man, that's that's so destructive. That's so that's such a destructive mindset to have because we all we all need help. I mean, hey. If Jesus had 12 disciples, right? I mean, if he had, if he needed help, I think we all need help. <laughs> and so um, asking for help, inviting people into your dilemma, inviting people into your struggle is so important. Inviting people into our struggle is hard. And I've used this example on a previous episode, but you know, it's almost like if you lived in a house and your house was a mess and the couch was flipped upside down and coffee table was on the other side of the room and everything was just all over and you were ashamed of inviting somebody else into your house, you knew you wanted to clean it up, but you needed help, but you wouldn't invite anybody in because it was so messy. You're stuck in that dilemma, that tension of, I need the help cleaning this up, but I'm so ashamed of inviting anybody else into this place. But what you're saying is you need to open the door and ask somebody to come in to help you move the couch and and move the coffee table and get things in order. And I think that's a really hard thing, but a really necessary thing for all of us. Absolutely. I mean, that's I think that's so just to kind of put it in another another perspective is like isolation. Right. I think that. The enemy, the. The enemy comes to isolate us and to make us feel like we've got everything under control or nobody wants to hear our struggles or our problems and everything. And I so far from the truth. So on the previous episode of the podcast, I had on Julie Burrill and episode 138, we talked about being broken. And uh, I think being broken is something that everybody sees in a, in a different light. Um, as a person of faith, what does it mean to you to be broken and how can you be strong and broken at the same time? Is that possible? I think that uh, with my story, yes, you can be both. I don't think it's, I don't think it's um, uh, this or that type thing. I think it's both and mm. it's very nuanced. And so I believe that whenever you show your brokenness, whenever you show your wounds, that gives other people permission to be courageous, to step out, to get, it gives them strength and it helps them to understand that they're not in it alone. And I think that we've probably all had situations where maybe you heard somebody tell a story and you thought to yourself, Oh my God, you too. Like I'm not, I'm not the only one. And you're not, um, we're all going through something. We're all wounded healers. And it's through that brokenness that God's light shines the brightest, you know, and connects us all. Mm, I love that phrase, wounded healers. Um, it also brings to mind uh, a Bible verse. So I'll read this. And then if we want to talk about it, we can. But it's Second Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 through 10. And it goes, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And uh, I don't think you can be broken and strong at the same time. 
without something else or someone else that is much bigger than you that makes that possible, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So important to have something that's whatever, whatever spiritual practice that is that to, to help you to understand you're not the center of the universe, you know, uh, some sort of transcend, trans, transcendent practice where you, you're aware of that you're aware of your fragility. You know, we're aware of our brevity, how short life is, um, that it can be taken in a moment. And, uh, we don't have the final say so. So one of the phrases that you shared before the podcast, uh, when you signed up to, to be on the episode was memento mori. And I love that phrase. It's a Latin phrase. You mind sharing what memento mori means to you? Remember, you must die. And another way to put it is from dust we were formed and till dust we shall, we shall return. And I think that just having that type of just remembering that, trying to keep that in front of your mind, you know, as you go, as you wake up in the morning, like I've been given this breath, I've been given this this day, I'm going to try to make the best of it because tomorrow is not promised, you know, and we must we must die. And so what can I do today? How am I living, you know, um, purposeful? How am I living to, I heard, I heard a friend of mine, um, I just actually met him the other day, but he said, we're all walking one another home. How can I walk somebody home today? Who can I be kind to? Wow. I, I'm writing that one down. One, because it's going to be in the show notes, but two, because I think I need to unpack that a little bit more. Um, and it goes hand in hand with something I was going to bring up, which is a lot of times when somebody's going through something tough or they need a perspective shift, uh, it's common practice to say, well, what would you, what would you say to yourself if you were looking back at this situation from your deathbed? You know, if you were taking your last breaths, what would be important in this moment? And while that is helpful, I think it's also important to realize that we are all dying men, right? We are, we are all slowly dying, right? As we live, as we live our lives, right? Where our time, which is so precious and so fragile is counting down and we don't know when that ends. And from that perspective, we, we have nothing to lose and we should live every day as if it's the last. Um, but that's hard to put into perspective on a daily basis. I find at least. Yeah, for sure. Um, so with that being said, uh, you run quite a bit. Uh, running is a big part of your life now. And this is the Project Endure podcast. So I'm wondering for you, when you hear the word endurance, what does that mean? Um, your ability to show up despite challenges, tragedies, setbacks, disappointment, um, and attack things with consistency dedication, um, and vigor, mm. you know, and, and having, having a good mindset and a good attitude about it. Mm. So do you think you would be as good of a runner as you are? Because you're, you're pretty, you're fast. Uh, and do you think you would be as positive of a person as you are without all of the pain that you've been through? Absolutely not. I don't think so. Um, you know, the, David said in one of his psalms, "It was it was good for me to be afflicted," and I I really resonated with that. It's good for me to be afflicted. It's good for us to go through. Um, it doesn't feel good in the moment, that's for sure. But at the end of the day, it definitely does something to us if we keep that growth mindset and we say, "Man, you know, I really hate for me. I want to speak for me." I really hate how I did my dad, but dang, I want to make sure I love my mom even that much harder. And we have a, we have a good relationship, you know? Um, I really hate that I went through that as a kid watching that with my mom and dad, but man, I want to try my best to not repeat the same stuff. I want to try my best to break some of those generational curses and traumas that my family's had. Like, and having that mindset, like, man, this sucks, but what can I do? Why do, why do what can I learn from this? 
one of my favorite quotes. And if anybody has listened to a handful of episodes, they might have heard me say this, but uh, it's from Christine Kane. And she said, sometimes when you're in a dark place, you think you've been buried, but you've actually been planted. And uh, I think you use the term God's fingerprints uh, have been on your life. And I think if we all look back hard enough and close enough, we can see those times where it felt like this was the end. There's nowhere to go from here. This is dark. This is hard. I don't know how it gets better. And then you fast forward and things do get better. And there was a reason and there is a purpose and you can find strength in the struggle. And sometimes it is good to be afflicted, even though it doesn't feel good in that moment. And so I appreciate you sharing that. And I wanted to just draw a parallel between you and two other guests that I've had on that I think is, is interesting. And I think you should connect with both of them because you had hit it off. Uh, episode 58 was with Kellen Matthews. Episode 93 is with Mitch Ammons. Um, all three of you guys are recovering from some serious addictions and all three of you guys are incredible runners and all three of you guys are incredible humans with amazing perspectives. And I don't think that's a coincidence. And I remember talking with Kellen on our episode about what makes him such a great runner. And he said, when he looked back at all the pain, all the hurt that he'd experienced and caused other people that nothing could ever compare to that pain. And so he knows that no matter how hard he runs, how much his legs hurt or his lungs burn, that it'll stop when he stops. And he can deal with that because of what he'd been through in the past. And I'm wondering if that resonates for, for you in running. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, definitely. Um, like I said, like my co my coach put it to me like this. He said, Caleb, there's no amount of headwinds that you're going to face in a race. There's no amount of cramping. There's no stomach issues. That's ever going to compare to what you've experienced to ever. That's ever going to compare to um, being in a jail cell, just, wishing that somebody would come and shoot me because I was freaking hurting so bad from withdrawals for, or it's, it's going to compare to the heartbreak and heart, the heartache that I caused my family. Like if this is what I have to endure, I'm doing pretty good. I'm, I'm living life pretty well then is that that's my mindset going into an event. Sure. And so speaking of running, just, you know, we can keep it brief, but what are you pursuing in the world of running? And are you just pursuing personal growth and, and the freedom that comes through the sport? Or do you have a, a tangible goal where you're saying, Hey, I want to hit this time. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is be a whole podcast. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do round two, but give me the short version. <laughs> okay. So, um, a few things, um, for 2024, I am pursuing uh, winning a regional marathon here in Asheville, North Carolina, um, running sub 240 there, hopefully 237, and um, a little bit further down the road. Um, Caitlin and I, I've been, I've, I've not announced it publicly, so this is going to be the first time. Uh, I'm planning on doing a um, continental run, so I want to run from california to wilmington for our nonprofit organization uh -huh. that's something i really want to do and as far as like it's not even like that's one way for me to give back and then also i'm going to be putting on some run camps here soon with uh, a friend of mine who we're going to be partnering up so just making sure my run is purposeful you know i want to make sure that i give the gift of running and movement to other people and so I just want to get back to kids, man. I want to get back to my community and I want somebody to look at me and my community and in indigenous community where a lot of us don't make it out and do anything incredible uh, athletic wise, even though we got a lot of talent. I want, I want a kid to look at me and say, man, if Caleb can run 237, I can be an Olympian, you know, like, and, and inspire that man. I, I, that's, that's what I want to do. I love it. And uh, I can't wait to watch it all unfold and support in any way that I can. And, uh, you know, before I ask the, the big wrap up question of the podcast, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask a little bit more about your Cherokee heritage and what that means to you. Um, Cause you, it's, it's very clear that you take a lot of pride in that. And uh, I would love to hear you speak on that and why it's important to you for a little while. Well, I'm just getting introduced to my, to my culture and I'm just embracing what that means to be for me to be Cherokee. Um, 
to kind of connect it back to to me running um I, as an indigenous man we believe running is worship we believe it's a prayer that you think you're thanking creator mm-hmm. for giving giving you an able body um there's something so profound and spiritual about getting up and running as the sun's coming up that that I really connect to um as far as like you know outside of outside of running um I'm really proud that we have a language that we have a thriving um community as far as like cultural events and everything's coming or as far as the culture events that we put on here in the community and educate people that's outside like we're very welcoming um you know, it's all, think about Cherokee, if think about indigenous people, man, it's like interconnectedness. That's one of the things I love about like taking care of, I heard it put this way and it, it, it resonated with me so, so well, but it said that sin is um, anything that we, we do to hurt ourselves, hurt one another. Um, we ha- it breaks relationship with with God or with Earth, and so that's a great way to explain indigenous interconnectedness. Like we believe all of it's all of it's connected. Um, within every man lies the whole world. That type of mindset. Like if you really want to make a profound effect, you work on yourself and then you help your fellow man. And that's kind of how we we look at things. We've gotten away from that a lot, but now we're coming back to it here in our community and everything. And uh, yeah, man, that's just a few of the things I'm I'm really connecting with here lately. I'm excited for you to learn more about the culture and and become more immersed in it because one, it sounds very profound, just uh, the culture itself, and two, it's clear that you are. Uh, so connected, even if maybe you don't feel as connected as you could, um, that it is just part of you to your core. And just a side note, these show notes, the show notes are basically going to be a short book that uh, short motivational book, because I've been writing down every phrase that you've been spitting out here and that within every man lies the whole world. Uh, There's just so much to unpack, but for now, Caleb, I'm going to ask you the final question of the podcast. And This one's important to me because as you know, everybody's going through something, Uh, you know, no matter where we are, no matter what life stage we're in, no matter what it looks like on the surface, we're all experiencing the human condition and that involves affliction and struggle and suffering at times. And so to anybody out there who's just going through it, who doesn't know where to go or what to do next, they're just in a dark place. What would you say to that person? that (laughs) this is always such a tough question Mm -hmm. that you're worth it that you have so much purpose and that your future is bright if you just choose to put your hand up, if you choose to just take the next step. Um, you don't have to figure it all out at one time. Just take the next step, you know, and, and ask for help because that, like I said, we're, it's, we're all interconnected. We're all walking to one another home. And um, if you just allow somebody to, help you to carry your burdens it can really really change your life in in so many profound ways and um when you get to the point to where you're strong enough make sure you turn around and help other people and make sure you give back and share those struggles because they need to be heard and that was exactly what someone needed and i'm sure about that and i appreciate you sharing not only that that last bit of wisdom, but just your story and everything that you are, Caleb. Uh, I got emotional a few times through the recording, and 
I'm just looking forward to growing our friendship. But if somebody wants to connect with you, if somebody wants to learn more about your story or just say thank you, where's the best place for someone to do that? Um, Instagram at underscore recovery lion, L I O N 86, or Facebook. That's most my first last name. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's probably the best way to reach out to me. Awesome. Well, I'll link that down below to make it easy for the people listening. And just want to thank you again. You're doing phenomenal things. And I think it's so inspiring that you've taken the things that once made you feel powerless and now are using them to help empower others. I think that's what life is all about. And I appreciate you leading from the front. Ski, I appreciate it. Hey, I want to teach you a, a, a Cherokee word right quick, Joe, yeah. and the listeners. So we don't have a word for goodbye, um, but we say do na go huh e, which means until we meet again. Do na. Do na. Da go. Da go. Huh e. Uh e. Huh e. Huh e. Yep. Do na da go huh e. Do na ga no. Uh, e. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, hey, that was close enough, Joe. Do na da go, huh? E. Until we meet again, brother. We are going to practice that. And yes, Caleb, until we meet again. Thank you, man. If you enjoyed this episode of the Project Indoor podcast, go ahead and subscribe, leave a review on your platform of choice, and share this episode with a friend. It helps us get more conversations like this out to more people like you. We appreciate you and we'll talk to you next time. And one more thing, if you're looking for a community of people all striving to be better together, check out the Project Indoor Hard Things Club. The link is in the description below. We'd love to have you.